Praise be Jesus and Mary. Amen. In today's first reading, we heard of the fall of Adam and Eve as recounted in the book of Genesis. The prominent character in these first few verses of Genesis chapter 3 is the serpent who was identified, identified in the last book of the Bible as the fallen angel known as Satan, Revelation 12, verse 9. Just the other day, we read Genesis chapter 2, and we heard that God placed Adam in the Garden of Eden, quote, to till it and to keep it, said in Genesis 2, verse 15. And commentators have noted that the language of tilling and keeping can actually be translated as a command to, to guard the garden. Also, the two Hebrew verbs that are used there for tilling and keeping are also used in the Old Testament book of Numbers in an interesting place. They're used to actually describe the liturgical services of priests and Levites as they served as ministers and guardians of the tabernacle of God. So if you put those two things together, you begin to see that Adam's duty to, of keeping watch over the garden was actually a form of divine liturgical service. It wasn't just a job to keep him busy. It was actually a sacred duty that he, duty that he was called to carry out. It was actually a vocation. That's why the rabbinic tradition considered Adam a priest, and they considered Eden not just a garden, but they considered Eden a sacred sanctuary. But here we see in Genesis 3 that Adam lets his guard down. An enemy enters Eden. And what does the sacred text say about the serpent? It says that he was the most subtle or the most cunning of all the animals, Genesis 3, verse 1. So we do have to give the devil his due, as it were. He is a master strategist. We see that here in Genesis chapter 3. We also see it, for example, in the book of Job. We even see it in the life of our Lord in the Gospels. His strategy in the garden is genial. He enters the garden and he avoids the head of the family, who is Adam, and instead he goes after the heart, as it were. He goes after Eve. He presents himself to Eve, and he strikes up a seemingly innocent conversation with her. He said, Did God say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Genesis 3, verse 1. I think any of us would have been caught off guard with such a question. It seems as harmless as someone bumping into the street. Uh, we bump into the street and someone uh, asks us for directions. They stop and ask us for directions. But something should seem strange here is that it's a serpent that's talking to you, right? Uh, but there are a couple of subtleties in what the serpent himself says. For example, first of all, and this is something that commentators have noted, and I think it fits well with the narrative. First of all, the serpent only calls God Elohim in the Hebrew text. He doesn't call him Yahweh Elohim. That's how God is referred to in the whole account of the Genesis creation of the narrative. What's the difference? The devil leaves out the word Yahweh, which is in the English. We translate that as Lord in the Latin. It's translated as Dominus. In Greek, it's translated as Kurios. We say Kyrie eleison during the Mass. Lord, have mercy. That comes from Kurios in the Greek. The serpent refuses to call God Lord, meaning that he doesn't acknowledge God's sovereignty or his dominion. And even that word dominion comes from that Latin word dominus, which means Lord or master. It's also a bad sign when Eve responds to the serpent, likewise not using the proper name of Yahweh or of Lord. She says, God, not the Lord God. This, of course, uh, all touches upon what we mentioned two days ago with our first parents, with them refusing to obey and therefore refusing to acknowledge God as Lord of their lives. So if we don't allow God to also be Lord, that means that we're going to try to live as if we're in charge of everything, as if we're in charge of our lives. And so our choices are not going to line up with how he tells us to live. Also here in Genesis 3, the serpent asks Eve if God forbade them from eating of all the trees of the garden. So his question, in his question, the serpent is intentionally exaggerating God's prohibition. 
When parents tell their children that they can't do something, at least I remember when I was a child, I would say this too, right? Uh, you, you tell them, you never let me do anything, right? That's the response. You never let me do anything. Uh, it's usually not true if you think about it. But the serpent here is trying to insert that same sense of distrust and dissatisfaction and even that sense of injustice into the heart of Eve. And we hear in Eve's response that even she begins to exaggerate God's prohibition. She says, God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Genesis 3, verse 3. God never said that you couldn't touch the tree. He never said that. He said you couldn't eat from it. So even by listening to her first words, we see that Eve is heading for a downfall. Her sympathies are seemingly more with the devil, to use an old uh, quote from an old song. They're seemingly more with the devil than they are with the Lord. And then the serpent opens up the attack with a bold-faced contradiction to God's word. He says, you will not die. Verse 4, God says you will die. The serpent says you will not die. But there are half-truths that are actually laced in that contradiction, and there, are, as there are in the other quote-unquote promises that the serpent gives to Eve. Our Lord says that the devil is the father of lies. He said in John 8, verse 44, and half-truths are his calling card. He says that Adam and Eve will not die in verse 4, and, and in one sense that's true because they lived for many years after the fall. He says in verse 5 that their eyes will be opened, and in one sense, that's true as well, because verse 7 says that their eyes were open, literally that they saw that they were naked. The devil says in verse 5 that they will become like God, and in one sense, even that's true, as God himself iterated in Genesis 3.22 when he said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. But because half of these half-truths are lies, that means in the end that it's all nothing but a lie. The serpent is telling Eve that God wants to limit their power and freedom, that God envies their happiness, that God sees them as competitors, and he even has ill will towards them, and therefore that he forbids them to do that which would put them on equal footing with God, namely eating the forbidden tree. It's all a lie, and it's all the devil projecting onto God his own defects, the defects of a fallen, disgraced creature. As one current political commentator noted a while ago, he said that whenever people on a certain side of the political spectrum, he said, whenever they accuse you of something, that's exactly what they themselves are guilty of. And we see that here with the serpent in the garden. The sins that he accuses God of are his own sins. So the serpent's distorted portrayal of God is really his own portrait. It's the portrait of the devil. Unfortunately, Eve, Eve consents to those lies and she embraces the temptation. She eats the fruit forbidden by the Lord, eats the fruit of the forbidden tree. And in verse 6, it says that she gave some of it to her husband. The Hebrew text there actually says, to her husband who was with her, meaning that Adam was actually right there the whole time, that he knew what was going on, that he heard the back and forth between the serpent and his wife, that he knew where that fruit came from. And instead of being a man, instead of intervening and guarding the garden and defending the truth, he chose to acquiesce and to share in his wife's sin. He let his guard down, and we're all still paying for that big mistake. So in our own lives, we need to be vigilant. We need to be on the lookout against the lies and the half-truths, against the temptations and the seductions of the devil. His strategy is always the same. His strategy is to put a wedge between us and the Lord. But like a hydra, one of those monsters from the ancient times that had many heads, like a hydra, he camouflages his lies and his half-truths with many, many disguises. If we're well-formed in our faith and if we allow ourselves to be guided by the Holy Spirit, then God 
will always unmask the workings of the devil to us, and he will always give us the grace to say no to sin and no to the devil. So let's ask Our Lady, the undoer of Eve's disobedience, let's ask her for the grace to close our minds and our hearts to the devil and to open them to the Lord God, the Lord who is master, who loves us, and who sent his son to more than make up for Adam's disgrace. Praise be Jesus and Mary.